and get started because I know that uh, we have a great um, message and time together with Michael. Um, so wanted as always just to um, say welcome and thank you everyone for joining us. We always look forward to these moments and I, I you know, I have to admit that after last year, um, which was just such a challenging year and and this still feels like just a continuation of the year, quite honestly, um, that these moments to take a pause and to reflect and to be inspired, but also to connect in community with one another are so very important. And, um, you know, some of you who, you know, are either our um, participants in our program, some of you who are volunteers, others who are partners um, from other faith communities and our staff, um, you know, many of us haven't been able to be in the same room with each other. Each other for a year now. Um, and so we just really cherish, we appreciate that you've come to join um, and be um, at this time together with us. And so it's my honor and privilege to be able to introduce Michael Jarbo. Um, Michael's actually one of the first pastors that I met uh, when I came on board here at MAM. So um, very cool. Uh, he is the senior associate pastor at MDUMC, Memorial Drive United Methodist Church. And he's the leading pastor uh, and preaching pastor of the journey. So it's a contemporary worshiping community um, out at MDUMC, super vibrant, um, incredibly like diverse and energetic and um, servant oriented community. Very, very cool. So um, uh, Michael's a graduate of Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary um, at Northwestern University in Chicago. And <clears throat> he moved to Houston um, in 2014, um, although he is a native of Texas. So, you know, he's got a, um, a podcast. So if you feel inspired um, by the message. Um, I was going to say you can check him out at the journey, but I mean, I, I assume you have some virtual journey going on right now. He, he can tell us more about that. Um, but Michael also hosts a podcast. So um, I've gotten a chance to participate in that, which is super fun. Um, and it's called Soul Care. And it's just conversations about how we renew our spirit. So I'm certain that um, we all could use a little bit of that. Um, he um, married, which I think is so sweet, his middle school sweetheart, Leslie. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and she owns a, um, a hair salon called Forward um, Salon in Houston, which I also think is really cool because in our work, we talk often about how salons and barbershops are actually um, really core places in our community where deep and important conversations happen. And in some cases, we even talk about like community-based uh, mental health support and um, just how important um, those spaces are where there's a safe place where people can, you know, share their lives together. So um, another um, arm of our, I would say in some ways, almost our faith community. So um, welcome, Michael. We're so excited. MDUMC, you know, has been since MAM's inception and just one of our core um, congregations, supporting congregations. And um, we love your congregation, the incredible volunteers, as well as your staff who, you know, consistently support our work. And um, we've loved being able to partner with you as we work together to strengthen the families in our community and to build a, a more caring community together. So welcome, Michael, and welcome everyone else who's joined us today to, uh, for this time together. Thank you so much, Sonia. And, um, you know, my, my wife grew up, she's a fourth generation pastor's wife in marrying me, which is which is a wild story. Her, she grew up in a, a faith tradition that was a little bit more uh, Pentecostal. Uh, it was in the Assemblies of God denomination, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, charismatic, great faith. But the spouse is seen a lot more at, and, and in most of those settings, uh, there are not very many women in leadership. And so it's the, it's the wife who is the spouse. They're seen as a pastor too. And Leslie made sure to let me know, marrying you, Michael, does not mean I have to be a pastor as well. Uh, I, that's not, that's not, you know, and a lot of times they, they sort of just do it. But I would say that Leslie pastors plenty of people in her salon chair every single day. Uh, and she hears some of the, the ups and downs of people's life and, and she's a gift to those people. So I'm, I'm grateful for her. Uh, in a way, I would say, I would call it ministry. She would say, stop, don't say that. But uh, <laughs> but I'm grateful for her. And so thank you, Sonia, for that introduction. And Bill, thank you so much for having me on. So uh, got a little, little devotional for us today. It's going to involve some questions for you guys. So be okay to turn off, uh, turn on your mic in a little bit when I, when I invite you to ask some questions. But there's going to be some good reflection today. I'm wondering if I can share my screen, Sonia. 
Uh, I'm gonna try, oh, host disabled attendee screen sharing. Let me see if that's okay. If not, it's it's not a deal breaker. Can you try again? See if I let you have that. I'll try again. Now. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay, are y'all able to see that? Yes. Yeah, thumbs up, thumbs up. Okay, yes. great. Awesome. Okay, well, good morning, friends. Again, I'm so glad that you're here. My name is uh, Reverend Michael Jarbo. My introduction has been awesome by Sonia, so I won't take too long uh, to, to say anything more, but thank you for allowing me to kick off the new year uh, with a uh, reflection. Um, this this uh, this week um, for the month of January. What a wild uh, first 27 days of the year it has already been, right? Uh, some people are calling it, you know, December, what, 57th or something of 2020. I've heard, I said, no, 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 no. We're in a new year. And so I think it's healthy for us to have a good uh, reflection as we go forward. So I want to start off with a little scripture today. Uh, therefore, as God's chosen people, this is coming from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. I love this scripture. Arguably in, uh, in my top, in my Mount Rushmore scriptures, uh, there, it's one of my favorite um, to, to read and reflect on. So I, I want to share that with you all today. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ of, uh, rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with the wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So I have a little icebreaker for us in this group today uh, to start off with. And it's going to invite, invite some vulnerability from this group. And I know it's a little early to do some, to get a little vulnerable. But I want to ask this question to kick us off. What's the worst clothing style choice you have ever made? And I'll let you know, I will be sharing what mine is very shortly. So you're not alone. Think back. It doesn't have to be, uh, maybe it was a fad uh, when you were in high school. Maybe it was a uh, uh, a dress you wore to a wedding that you were always like, oh my gosh, why did I wear that? Maybe there are a pair of sneakers that you thought you were cool with. What, what, <laughs> what is the worst clothing style choice that comes to mind that you've ever made? Don't be shy and make sure you take off your, I, I don't have everyone's full screen. So um, just chime in kind of popcorn answer. Well, my yeah. wife would say it's my Hawaiian shirt collection. <laughs> Okay, Bill. Nice. I bell bottoms. Being a pro. Bell bottoms. <laughs> awesome. I was hoping someone would say bell bottoms. What else? A um, crop top and hot pants. A crop top and hot pants. Lynn, thank you for that one. Very good. Uh, Very uh, good. Sixties. So. The sixties. <laughs> <laughs> clarify it was the 60s that's right you can you can say anything and then say it was the 60s I feel like and you can get by there yeah yeah I used Anyone to else? when I was uh in high school I used to wear really really baggy clothes because I was trying to hide how skinny I actually was and didn't realize that it just made it worse right they were just falling right off of you right yeah 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 oh my gosh it's so good Probably hot pants in the 60s. <laughs> in the 60s, okay. 
All right. <laughs> well, I love bell bottoms, but I also one with moccasins. I don't know if anybody remember moccasins. <laughs> oh yeah. Yes, Yvonne, moccasins. Yes. <laughs> moccasins. Yeah. I mean, okay. Yeah. I'll reveal my age, but I, I also wore baggy pants because it was the 90s, the early 90s, and it was grunge. So I, I paired them with flannels and, you know, Nirvana t-shirts. So um, there you go. Yeah. Hey. I regret it now. It was not flattering. I'm dating myself <laughs> here, but does anybody remember the Nehru jacket? Ne the Nehru jacket. Is that what I heard? That's before your time. <laughs> it was horrible. Inspired by the Beatles. Yeah. Okay. That sounds cool. But I actually used to wear those. I forgot the guy with the big, big leg pants. Yeah, were those uh, were those Jinkos? Maybe I don't know. But I still have them. I can't fit them anymore. But I was like as thin as a pencil. They, they were harem pants. Um, MC Hammer. MC yes, Hammer. and I still, I still have oh, them. Diaper pants. Hammer <laughs> pants. I still have them. Yeah. Yeah. And if you watch, uh, I don't know about you, but my wife and I were walking in Target the other day, and it the, all the clothing for the young women look like what you could buy in the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. It, it, doesn't fashion return and leave and return and leave? Mm -hmm. um, Recycles. You know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's good. Okay, you guys were very vulnerable. Thank unless unless Sonia's got one, she's just like wants to share. <laughs> oh, I think the MC Hammer pants are probably at the top of my list. <laughs> okay, all right. Well done, well done, well done. Good, good, good. All right, so I'll share mine and mine mine comes with a picture as well. My fashion style. Uh, I am the guy over to the far right, jumping in the air uh, with a, with a with a darker hair. Uh, was I like to put vests with t-shirts. Oh. This picture was taken in 2005. Uh, I was uh, in a 2000s, early 2000s cover band called Three Day Weekend. And this was the photo shoot we took. Uh, I was a college student in Shreveport, Louisiana. So down, kind of downtown in Shreveport, we went around, took photos, and the jumping pick was great. But almost all my pictures from 2004 to about 2008, I try to put a vest, like a, almost like a tuxedo vest, with a t-shirt. And I thought that was the coolest thing. And we played at sorority houses, and um, we played at a little art gallery down the road, and, and we were just sort of a, a a goofy little cover band that tried our best, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so there's a little picture evidence for you guys. Um, I think we all have things that we could, uh, if we could go back and reverse, um, that we might in our own fashion sense. Uh, I, I don't know if I would have worn so many uh, vests with t-shirts if I could, um, but when I look at this picture, um, I realized that was a choice that I made. Uh, and uh, as, as foolish as I look, I'm also sort of envy the carefree kid in his 20s in that picture who had a big, big heart for Jesus, uh, who was deeply in love with the church, trying to find the church in a new way uh, that time, um, you know, over a decade ago. Um, didn't know he wanted to be a pastor. <laughs> that kid had no clue he was going to be a pastor in Houston, Texas, taking that picture. Um, and who looked in the mirror every day and said, you know what, I look good in this vest and t-shirt. As I walked out of my dorm room uh, to go where I need to go. Um, as I think as disciples of Christ, it's important for us or even followers of God to reflect on kind of three core phrases of how we're doing, how we dress ourselves, how we present ourselves as uh, followers of God in the world. Those three words are upward, inward, and outward upward inward and outward how like i think that's a healthy uh kind of rubric to invite ourselves to reflect on and the thing is with all however many 25 plus people that are on this call right now it's something we all can look at and it's all we're all at different places on the spectrum for those so how is your relationship up, you know, upward you know if, if you know 
God is all around us, we believe, but just kind of citing, looking up, how is our one-on-one relationship with God? How are we doing inwardly and how are we doing outwardly? And as I'm coming into this new year, I've really been focused on that inward word. And uh, I was actually really um, mindful of it during Advent, you know, as a pastor, as all of us in, in, in work in the, our, our respective ministries and, and places, um, it sort of felt a little bit, I've, I describe it to people like a, a yoga class where, you know, you do yoga uh, and you do it for the first time, maybe ever, or in a long time. You, the next morning you wake up and you've stretched uh, parts of your body that haven't been stretched before in a long time. And you're feeling that aching, like, oh, I didn't know I could hurt right there. I didn't know I'd stretch that. I, I kind of compare that to 2020, that a lot of us had to be so innovative, so um, uh, on our toes, so agile uh, in our workspaces that we've stretched areas of ourselves that have never been stretched before. And it's okay to say, ow, that hurts. And I think you all need to get permission to say, ow, it hurts. I, I'm sure that culture, ma'am, says it's okay to say, ow, it hurts, because it does. What we've, what we've gone through has challenged us. And so I've been thinking about inward. And as we get to the new year, I'm one of those guys who are like, all right, clean slate, let's start again. But after 2021, after 2020, I said, let, let me focus more in on this inward um, area of my life of how I'm caring for it. Um, this is the, uh, you know, I, I said this year I'm going to make inward a spiritual priority for me. And I hope that maybe you guys can continue to do that in your own, in your own lives and faith and ministry. This is, inward is the one where you have to stand in front of the mirror and see what is the root of the choices I make every day. Where does the choice, you know, Michael made a choice to put a vest on uh, with a t-shirt in his early 20s. You all chose bell bottom, right? We make choices every day, but what, how is that choice central nervous system? How is that choice system doing today? Have you checked on it? Have you cared for it? It needs to be reflected on. If we peel back the layers, what are our intentions? I love this quote by, uh, Anne uh, Rand, she's a Russian-American writer, and, and I always go back to this when I reflect on my spiritual faith. She says, to say I love you, one must first know how to say the I. One must first know how to say the I. Uh, have, you, have you cared for yourself in that way? You know, I always, uh, I always am interested by uh, on airplanes, though I haven't been on an airplane in a long time, uh, why they often will say that when if if the the oxygen uh, you know is deployed and you have a small child next to you, first put on the oxygen mask and then lean over and help the child. And I'm like, wait, that goes against all logic, right? You're a parent or you're a guardian, like you're supposed to help the child first. But the truth is, if you don't care for yourself, friends. How are you going to care for the person to your right or to your left or near you? Uh, and that don't hear that as selfishness. Hear that as a priority for you and for your life. Um, so, so do that. So care for yourself. Um, the question that I come back to more and more uh, for myself, and I want to kind of let this be the guiding question for us today, is do you know what's in your spiritual closet? Do you know what garments you wear in your spiritual closet? Um, I think a lot of times we wear the fashion of those uh, good old days because it's just comfortable, right? We, we, like, we like what we learned a long time ago. And so that's sort of our comfort zone. So we don't outstretch like what we know, you know? Oh no, we're not contemplative people because we can't do contemplation because we can't sit still for five minutes long. So I'm going to be comfortable in this outfit that says, oh, you know, uh, I, that's not my thing, right? We get comfortable in our old clothes and our old faith styles and don't, aren't willing to stretch ourselves. Um, but even with our faith, we have some spring cleaning to do. I really believe that. And it's healthy for us. Um, so ask yourself, what needs to be put on again to see if it fits? What needs in your faith closet need to be mended or taken uh, uh, to a place to get sewn up again? And then also what garments are 
needing to go and be taken to NAMM, <laughs> to the resale store, uh, that need to be helped out for other folks as well. Have we, have we done that reflection? Have we cared for that? That, does, that takes work. It, it's not something we can just check off on a post-it note. It takes reflection. Um, I, uh, I love, I know I'm belaboring the, the clothing metaphor this morning, friends, but I hope you'll go with me because if it was good enough for us this morning, it was good enough for Paul to Colossians because he talked about clothing ourselves. Uh, I love reading this scripture at weddings because people are in such nice clothes, far nicer than they normally wear. And I always talk about like, yeah, after today, the tux is gone. The beautiful white dress is taken off and hung up to look at for years to come. Uh, but you have to choose to wear clothes every single day, just like you have to choose to love your spouse every single day. You have to choose to wake up in the morning and go out and be a respectable human in today's wild world. So how are you choosing those clothes? So uh, I want to read this scripture for you. Uh, it says, therefore, this is Ephesians 3, 13 through 7, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done, sorry about that. Oop, and after you have done all of this, uh, after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up a shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Paul says we literally put on, uh, like we put on the attributes of Christ in our life and we wear those out. But how are we choosing to put those on? Do we need a refreshment? Do we need to know what we're putting on uh, to care for ourselves? So, I do have a little um, table kind of talk question. If we were if we were all together right now, um, what would we? Um, sorry about this. Yeah, if we were all together right now, um, we would um, we would sit around the group and have some conversation. But I want to have some conversation here uh, with you all today. So here are the eight attributes that Paul lists in that Colossians text. Uh, he lists compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, thankfulness, and love. So let me just ask around again, we're going to go to popcorn like we did with the clothing uh, uh, question at the very beginning. Uh, which one of these spiritual garments God gives each of us needs more attention today? Why? What, what areas of life will they benefit? So I want to go around the room a little bit. Uh, and just sort of ask, what, which one's popping out right now? Or maybe you see one, you're like, oh, that's been there for a while. Um, what comes to mind? I'll be quiet for right now. Let me, let me hear you all. Love. Love. Cannot have enough of that. Whew. You are right. Probably patience. Yeah, patience. I'm in need of patience. Yes, patience. When I was in college, my own mother gave me a little sign that said, God, give me patience, and I want it right now. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty bad when for, your own mother Was it gave for me her, that. or was it for you, Bill? No, it was for me. It's from my mother, so I, I'm confessing. Got it. <clears throat> I think patience, for me, patience, because uh, how much longer is this going to last? Oh, that's what it is. Uh, I think for me, all of those for sure, but uh, what God's uh, had me focus on through all of this is thankfulness. It's so easy for me to get caught up in um, the critical thinking part, what's, what's happened, what's going wrong, what's but there have been so many areas this year for my husband and I to be thankful. And it yeah. was just a gift from God to, to really just um, be able to worship him in our thankfulness. Mm. Compassion for me. Um, 
I have to learn how to understand that there is a whole segment of the population that did not get what they wanted and are now angry. And I can't let that make me crazy. I have to learn how to, you know, be able to talk to them if I need to stay away from the conversation. But I just need to be kinder to them. Oh, man. She's on the other side. That is spot on. Oh. For me, I think it would be gentleness. Um, we were just uh, talking as a family. I have three kids and um, talking about how um, my kids tend to be, you know, snarky and sarcastic and short with one another. Um, and so, of course, as parents, we're quick to want to put that out um, and uh, urge them in another direction and talk about what they see on TV or what they're listening to on, you know, social media. Um, but it really made me reflect and wonder how, how much of that comes from, you know, what um, their mother models for them. Um, and so it really challenged me um, to recognize, especially in a year where there's so much, you know, going on um, around us, um, just my interactions um, and, and gentleness is, is a great one for me. Oh, yes, yeah, so, you know, my, my word was gentleness as well. And it's actually gentle to myself and being kind to myself. And I'm realizing that um, I, um, going on, I'm a, so as you can, this is not my regular home friends with all this <laughs> wooden wall. I'm at a retreat center in Broken Bow, Oklahoma with a couple other pastors. And um, to kind of start the year off, we, we all got our COVID tests and said, we got to meet up. And so we went to Broken Bow to kind of get away from Houston. And I know it's a luxury I'm, I'm thankful I get to have this week um, with, uh, with my friends at MDMC holding down the fort. But man, uh, yesterday morning, I woke up early and there was still a fire kind of going a little bit from the night before outside. And I got a cup of coffee and kind of got the fire back to back to a place that was sustainable a little bit and just sat in one of the lawn chairs out there and just silence the crackle of the fire. And I was like, this is what gentleness looks like. This is what care to, for me looks like. And it made, it brought me to tears yesterday because I haven't done it in so long. Um, and so a buddy came out and was like, are you crying? I said, no, I'm fine. Uh, you know, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, yeah, because it was just good for my soul. And the gentleness to my soul, um, I care for a lot of people holding a lot of weight and a lot of stuff. And so do you all in so many capacities. And we can be the gentle, caring people there. But if we don't care gently for ourselves, if we don't, ah, man, it, it weighs on you over time. It really does. Were there any other thoughts before we moved on? Um, I, I think a lot about humility. Yeah. Um, and how lacking it is in our world right now, how it seems like every person is so certain in their opinion about politics, about faith, about how other people should live um, and what other people should think and believe and, um, and how Ooh. rarely we are willing to cede our will to God um, and, and even ask, are we certain this is God's will? Um, so it's, um, it's something I think is really, um, a, a really rare attribute these days. Humility. Oh my gosh. Mine would be uh, forgiveness. I, the one I find the most difficult, you know, I, I think, uh, I'm feeling a lot of anger and, yeah, forgiveness is the one that I, I really struggle with. So it's up there. And I loved it when you said patience with, with self because I'm, I'm at that point too where I'm trying to be patient because there's so many things that I want to accomplish um, as far as, you know, reaching goals. Like I'm very creative and so I want to do all these things which we really struggle with, I will struggle with right now. So a friend of mine gave me this. She believed she could. She believed she could, but she needed a break. So she said no. So I'm trying. To <laughs> and, and I love my friend for this. So I'm trying to remember that although I want to accomplish these things right now, we're in a place where 
we can't do all the things that we want to accomplish, whether it's like save the world, because it's not our place to save the world, but just doing what we can. So I'm trying to be patient with myself in that, realizing that, you know, we do have to balance our the uh, 24 hours a day that God has given us. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Yvonne. Thank you. And I will get one of those mugs. Maybe change the pronoun. Maybe not change the pronoun. Just... <laughs> Just take it. That's a good reminder. It's okay to say no. I am the worst at that. Mm. So am I. Uh, okay. Good. Gosh, y'all are so good. Uh, have I mentioned yet it's okay to ask for help? <laughs> I feel like that's like, that is my constant. I, I'm trying to crush the taboo in my congregation over a memorial, which is a congregation with uh, significant wealth, but also you've got Folks that are, it's, it's a large church, and so folks travel in from the Heights or from Katy, from Montrose. But for the most part, there is a number of people who are uh, just wealthy, and they don't, but, and yet they're, they're the ones who are the least willing to say help, because uh, help is a weakness. Like, I'm, I'm trying to demystify, demythify uh, the going to therapy. And if you, if, if, I know there are even therapists on this call right now. Like therapy is such a good thing for the soul. And I have to say, even preachers, and it's like, you know, you see like politicians or even our pastors uh, taking pictures of getting the vaccine right now who are, who are getting the COVID vaccine. It's good for that representation for people to see like, uh, oh, you're a sane person in my life and you're getting uh, counseling. Then maybe I need to get get it as well. Like it's so important for us, and so I, I try to remind people as much as I can. Don't make it a taboo, uh, or find a spiritual advisor. Guys, Google is a, an incredible machine. Look up spiritual advisors, or ask somebody in your congregation or a dear friend. That, can you be my accountability partner? Check in on me. I I'm really honing in on 2021 to be more gentle, or to be more patient, or show more compassion. Will you help me there? Um, and people, I promise you, more than you think will, will help out. Um, and, and so lean into that. Even pastors need therapy, and, and I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can with that. Uh, there's this book called The Wesley Challenge. Wesley, John Wesley uh, is uh, the, the founder of the United Methodist, uh, not the United Methodist, but the Methodist movement uh, many years ago. And uh, this guy named Chris Fulmsby wrote, wrote this uh, quote, and I love, I love this line. He says, a strong person admits the need for help and calls out for it. Uh, we are not a failure because we are failing at something. Who needs to hear that again? We are not a failure because we are failing at something. Our strength does not reside in our own self. Our strength comes from God, the source of all strength and life itself. <sighs> Just like, can you breathe that in and breathe it out a little bit, friends? Like, where does your source of strength come from? I guarantee you it's not Facebook. I know, I know. You thought coming into this it was, it was social media or the news or uh, Twitter or uh, a friend uh, on, down the street with that political sign still in their front yard. You thought it was them, but, um, but it's not. It, our source of strength, our source of peace, where we get this from. And if you fail at something, you are not a failure. Just take that in. Um, I think what Chris Folmsby is saying here is it's a call for authenticity. Uh, to be an authentic Christian takes the necessary time to inspect the interior life. What would it mean to confess that we don't have it all figured out? Is that okay? If I know anything about Sonia G., she has helped to create an environment at MAM where it's okay to say, I don't have it all figured out. Uh, and that, what a healthy, gracious space that is. Uh, um, and I've, I've seen that through Bill and for many others of you on this call uh, who have, have opened that, that place to, to do that, to share, uh, to be vulnerable. Um, it's important for us to dive into the important work of repair, of caring for ourselves. Um, so the first thing I think we need to do uh, is to, um, I'll come back to that quote, is to slow down. Um, I, I'm reading uh, on Audible because <laughs> Audible is my safe space and it's like where I will actually 
while I'm in the car or listening. Uh, and I have to remind myself not to listen to it at like one and a half speed, uh, especially on this book that I'm reading right now by a guy named John Mark Comer called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Uh, uh, the book came from this guy, John Mark Comer from Portland. It's a big orange book. You can look it up online. Uh, again, it's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And uh, the book came from this idea that uh, his spiritual advisor, um, John Ortberg, uh, who uh, uh, lives in, um, I think he's in the North Texas area, don't quote me on that, John, John Ortberg, uh, he's a spiritual director uh, for John Mark Comer, but John Ortberg's spiritual director is this guy named Dallas Willard. You may have heard the name Dallas Willard before. Um, Willard is a, kind of a spiritual guru and a follower of Jesus. And Ortberg one day asked a Willard, he said, hey, what do I need to do to become the me I want to be? What do I need to become the me I want to be? And Willard responded, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Uh, he said, um, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And then Ortberg said, okay, cool. I'll eliminate hurry from my life. I can do that. So what else? Which is typical us, right? Like, okay, you gave me the answer I'm looking for. Now what? <laughs> I do that all the time. Okay, that's hard. I, I, what else? What's the easier option there? And Ortberg said, there is not, there is nothing else. Hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. How many of you would describe yourself as feeling hurried in today's world? Uh, uh, we've got to slow down. we got to do it now. Uh, we, we can't zoom through our closet going from, you know, cl clothing to clothing in our spiritual closet and say, okay, well, I'll just throw it all out. Or uh, I haven't looked far enough to see what needs to be cared for. How helpful would it be, friends, if you made time for yourself during this week um, to, to care for ourselves and slow down? And the truth is you have time, like you really do. Uh, we did a sermon series at MDMC recently called 167. You're like, what is 167? Well, we believe that there are we don't believe, we know. We all have 168 hours a week. That's how long a week is, 168 hours a week. And the question is, we use one of those hours for church. So what are you doing for the other 167? What are you doing? That's a lot of hours. Can you give more than just one hour a week towards God? Can you give more than one hour a week towards worship or caring for yourself? I think we have to in order to sustain in the world that we live in. Um, how helpful would it be if you just made time for yourself? So write it down, make it part of you. It's important for us. Um, I want to close today um, by um, reflecting on one more piece. Um, I'm in, currently just like in love with Romans 12. I keep going back to Romans 12 all the time. It's just chock full. It's maybe one of my favorite passages of all of Paul. And what I want to do this morning is we've talked about some of those words. Some of you share words like compassion or patience or love or gentleness or care. So let me ask you, what do those words look like in action? I think Romans 12, and I'm going to read past, uh, verses 9 through 12. This is going to be kind of a little bit like Lectio Divina, which is Lectio Divina is the process of hearing the scripture read, reflecting on the words, and then hearing it read again, and maybe finding a word or a phrase that you can just kind of hold on to. And so we're going to do that with this passage in Romans uh, chapter 12. And I want you to see what word that's been on your mind. Maybe... Uh, the comparison uh, or the connection to um, to the passage at hand. So when I was in preaching class in, in seminary, my professor said, Michael, and this is a, a critique, uh, uh, she's in, she was from Trinidad. I'm not going to do her impression of her voice, but she was just a feisty woman from Trinidad who was 
awesome. And she taught me some great lessons. And she goes, Michael, a lot of times you're trying to preach five sermons in one. <laughs> and I'm like, I know, but I have a lot to say. And they're like, uh-huh, cool. And so she reached across her desk and she grabbed a Nestle's Crunch Bar and a Nestle, uh, I think it's a Nestle's Butterfinger. No, is that right? Butterfinger, I think Butterfinger and Crunch are the, it doesn't matter. Anyway, she held these two candy bars next to each other. She goes, you know what? There's a lot of similarities in these two, right? They both have chocolate. They both kind of have a nut in them. If you look at all of the, the calories, they might even have the same amount of calories in them. They might, uh, there's a little bit of orange in this wrapper. There's a little bit of orange in this wrapper. So there's a similar, like there's a lot you can say about these two. But what if you looked at your sermons like you were going to find one of similar qualities between the two and lean into that? And I was like, it was a little light bulb uh, moment for me in my preaching life that you don't have to say everything about the text that you see. But what's that one piece that you can connect to to share the gospel? That's sort of my, uh, I gave you, I showed my cards on my, how I write sermons each week, friend. Is I'm, I'm looking for the one. Uh, and I, I've gotten better over the years. It's still a struggle. So, okay, I digress. We're going to go into Romans 12. And I want you to find with those candy bars, the one, what's the connector? with the word compassion or gentleness or patience or love uh, or kindness. No one said kindness. I think we all can continue to be more kind to one another. Okay. So kind of find yourselves wherever you are and get, get comfortable in a place. If you want to close your eyes, that's okay. Um, and uh, don't fall asleep. Uh, close your eyes and I'm going to read the scripture to you. This is Romans 9 verses, uh, excuse me, Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. I want you just to hear the words. I'm going to give a little bit of time. Then I'm going to read it, and this is probably uh, people who follow Lectio Divina would say, okay, you're breaking the Lectio Divina process, but I'm going to read it again in Eugene Peterson's translation called the Message Version of it. And I'm going to, it's a little bit more contemporary, a little more modern than the NIV uh, that I'll read for you today. And then at the end, I just want you maybe find one line from these two versions that stick out. We'll talk about that and then we'll close with some prayer. Okay. That's our process from here on out. So hear these words, friends, from Paul to the Romans. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If she is thirsty, Give her something to drink. In doing this, you will heat burning coals on her head. Do not become, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And from the message. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. 
run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they are down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not good for you. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. And if he's thirsty, go get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. So friends, what line, what word? Is there anything that's sticking out? Maybe something that you're like, I, don't, I didn't want to hear that one, Red. Um, anything? Go ahead, go ahead, Jeanette. The difference between the NIV and the message, the scripture that um, reads about heaping coal on their heads, I've always used that when people have done something to me and felt really bad because it's kind of like, yeah, I'm going to get you. I'm going to put some coals on your head. But here, <laughs> um, just the wording of it, makes it better okay just go get them some lunch maybe they'll be happy versus thinking about an evil way to do it by embarrassing them or something like that and then the other one that stuck out for me was don't be stuck up i like that <laughs> mm. yes um i'm i'm a yeah. jew I'm Jewish. So what I don't understand, what is the message? Um, like, is that just a translation or um, could you explain? Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Annie, for asking. Yep. That's a translation. Uh, Eugene Peterson is a, a pastor and uh, preacher. He was a theologian at New York Seminary. He died a few years ago um, uh, in 2018, but he was tasked with translating the Bible in a more approachable and modern way. So both, both Old Testament and New Testament, um, the entirety of, of all of scripture. So uh, it's a, he, he was an Old Testament scholar as well. Um, and so um, it would be, if you're, if you're interested in reading it, and let me tell you, I got, it, I think uh, the translation came out in 2003. So it's actually relatively new, and they have not. Uh, he did not do a reprise of the or a. Uh, you know, you've got the new. You've got the NIV version, which is a new international version that was done in twenty uh, two thousand in, in the eighties, and then it got more uh, inclusive language, uh, taking out a bunch of the he's uh, in twenty eleven. So that changed sort of happened. So you can tell which NIV translation you have. Is it pre twenty eleven or post? The Eugene Peterson is only one translation. It was written in the 90s, 2000s. You know, when you were wearing your grunge gear uh, there. Uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, we all were. Um, so, um, yeah, that translation came out in 2000. So it's just a, a translation. You know, it, you wouldn't ever quote this in seminary or in uh, at probably in the academia. Uh, it's not one that's like, uh, this is the actual Greek translation by any means. Uh, but for a college kid like me uh, in the early 2000s, it saved my life. Uh, it gave me a translation that was really um, eye-opening and was much more approachable. So you're welcome. <laughs> well, my uh, experience is that as I read and reread, I love this uh, 9 through 21. I, I thank you for pointing us to this. 
um, I, I'm just thinking this is Jesus. This is the perfect example. This is how he would react. This is who he was. Uh, he did that. He blessed his enemies. And but back again, I go to the word love. And I have on my in my walk had experiences, had days when I've spent time in the word. When I have had a love for for people around me, and it, it's just. And I wish I could say it was every day, all day long. It's not. But I have this love that Jesus showed us how to love. It is the center. It's almost like it's the center. And when you've got that, when you really, you're completely committed to him through this love that he has shown you, then you can be about your father's business because that's what all this is, being about his business and sharing and ministering to others. It's not about you at all. You're not even thinking about you because you're not in the picture, but right. you are looking out. And every day here in Houston, I promise you, every day I have an, an opportunity to share. And that's what we need to be doing because we're running out of time. Yeah, right. The, the two words that uh, stood out to me in the, in the first version, uh, one was harmony. Say it again. Harmony. Harmony. Um, and, I, and I think potentially because of all of the things that we've talked about, how we clothe ourselves, how we interact with people, um, I guess, you know, here at MAM, we talk often like we do so much, but at the end of the day, what's the impact, right? How, how, do, how, how is our community different? How are families different? And I guess, you know, I think about harmony and I think it's deeply rooted in this concept of shalom, right? And um, what I believe we're all working towards and being a part of. And the, the other word that, you know, um, is prevalent in that scripture is with, the word with. And it connected with a lot of different words, but um, I just think that this idea of community and connection and being with one another, and I love that it juxtaposed, you know, you can be with your enemy or with your friend, you can be with someone in sorrow, you can be with them, and but that being together, um, and like you said, it's not necessarily about getting it all right, but it's the commitment to be together in the good and the bad and the hard and to support one another and know that, you know what, we will learn together, we will grow together if we're willing to stay together. And to me, mm -hmm. that's something that as an individual, as an organization, and I think certainly as a community and nation. So to me, it's really exciting, like a day like today and an opportunity to be with several of, you know, folks that are part of the MAM community, because I think we represent something really beautiful, which is, yeah, you know, yeah. we are an incredibly diverse group of people, um, but um, our willingness to put aside those differences and focus on, you know, where we um, are, you know, what we all do believe in together, right, and, and work and put that into action, so, yeah. Oh, well said, Sonia. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because I'm I'm reading this line, discover beauty in everyone if you've got it in you. There's a period there, but I keep seeing it as like one sentence. Um and I like I just like this idea of like what we have like so I'm I'm also a clergy person and like I'm a big proponent of therapy as well. And one of my therapists said to me, um, not one, my therapist said to me, um, you know, when I was dealing with somebody who was so angry, she said, what do you get when you squeeze a lemon? And I was, I was like, what, what are you talking about? She says, Annie, what do you get when you squeeze a lemon? You get lemon juice. And I was like, right. She said, so when someone is so angry, they're filled with anger. And, um, and so like, First of all, so I love what you just said with the word with, oh my gosh, it spoke to my soul. Thank you. Um, and I think that you were able to see that because that is what was in you. And right. we discover beauty in everyone if we've got it in us. We see love in others if we've got that in us. Like we can be compassionate if we've got it in us. So I just, instead of that period, I want to make it like a comma um, and um, and and fill each, you know, fill all of us with, you know, with what we need to to bring into the world. Annie, you make it a comma, my friend. Just make it a comma, okay? I think Eugene would be okay with that. God rest his soul. 
Yeah, make it a comma. That's good. That's it. That's that, again, you, and you're pointing back to that. What's in your spiritual closet? Your, you know, Sonia found with. I'm, I'm saying, what's in your spiritual closet? We get a lot, we get concerned a lot about other people's spiritual closet. Ooh, that, that person must not know or love God. <laughs> how, about you, how about you work on your spiritual closet first? And when we have it, like you said, exactly what you said there, Annie, is that when we have it, we can express it to others. Can I make one All quick on statement? Right Go ahead. Yes, I was just gonna make I was just gonna make one quick statement. I love what somebody else said earlier too that we have to remember that it's not all about us. And my father used to say that you catch more bees with honey, and so that really does work. <laughs> so yes, awesome. Okay, friends, that about wraps up our time. I do want to close with one more little quote. It's it's Elizabeth Gilbert is uh, one of my favorite writers. Uh, she did Eat, Pray, Love. You've probably seen that. There's a movie. I think Julia Roberts plays her in the movie, uh, but she's just done incredible stuff. I've listened to a few podcasts with her. I keep coming back to her, uh, but she says this in Eat, Pray, Love, and I'm going to leave it with y'all. We search for happiness everywhere, but we are like Tolstoy's fabled beggar who spent his life sitting on a pot of gold under him the whole time. Your treasure, your perfection is within you already. But to claim it, you must leave the by commotion of the mind and abandon the desires of the ego and enter into the silence of the heart. I go back to that all the time. We're sitting on the pot of gold that's already ours. And we have all those tools with us. God gives us every single one of those, uh, every single one of us those tools and gives us this thing called grace, which is hard to wrap our mind around. And if we're so mindful of that grace and in that we can begin to peel back and look in our spiritual closets and find that there are so many beautiful garments, some needing to be repaired or, or, or brought to ma'am, uh, others, that we can find in fashion and wear together. So I invite you in 2021, brothers and sisters, to keep your spiritual closets alive and well. So that ends my time today, but it's been such a gift to be with you all. And thank you for your involvement uh, today in, uh, in all things. Uh, let me go back to this, stop sharing. Yeah, in all things, uh, uh, your faith and, and spiritual continue to, to to care for it as much as you can. And I'm here, people at MDUMC and other com faith communities are here as well to help you along the way. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Sonia, for this time and for all of you. Michael, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your, and your the thoughts of your heart. Bless you, my friend. Thanks, friends. <laughs>